time we had a lead at halftime, he would tell us not to get that silly satisfaction, thinking that the game was over. Of course, he only got to tell us that about probably two or three times because <laughs> we were terrible. But uh, the point was that he didn't want us to get complacent because the game wasn't over yet. And that's what we want to talk about this morning for a while. Not my football team, but complacency uh, as it relates to us, our spiritual lives. Complacency is a feeling of quiet pleasure or security, often while unaware of some potential <coughs> danger, defect, or block. Self-satisfaction or smug satisfaction with an existing situation, condition, etc. We can look in the scriptures, we can see a couple of uh, warnings against complacency. Proverbs 24, turn with me to Proverbs 24. Let's see what the wise man has to say there. Proverbs 24, beginning in verse 30. Proverbs 24, beginning in verse 30. I went by the field of the lazy man, and by the vineyard of the man devoid of understanding, and there it was, all overgrown with thorns. Its surface was covered with nettles, its stone wall was broken down. When I saw it, I considered it well. I looked on it and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. So shall your poverty come like a prowler and your need like an armed man. You see this lazy guy, he's, he's got a field, doesn't mean he was always lazy. But the problem was is that he was complacent. He, was, he became lazy. Uh, and, and you can see the condition of his property, his vineyard and so forth, the walls. Because of that laziness, because of this complacency. You know, you've got a vineyard. Okay, I've got a vineyard. It's doesn't go away from year to year. I'll just trust in this vineyard that I've got. But then you don't do the work for it. And over time, it becomes overgrown and, and unfruitful. The same thing with the walls. This wall has been built. I can trust in this wall. I can be satisfied with this wall. But what happens when you stop maintaining anything? Entropy takes over. It's going to break down. It's going to need repair. It's going to quit doing its job. We can see the, the complacency in this person. Turn with me to Revelation 3. Revelation 3. Jesus, speaking to the church in Laodicea, he says, To the angel of the church of Laodicea, in verse 14, these things said, right, these things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, I have become wealthy and have eaten nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold and find in the fire that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed. The shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. You've got the, the Laodiceans who were lukewarm, uh, physically prosperous, materially prosperous, and complacent uh, spiritually because of their material wealth. Jesus says you don't realize that you're miserable, wretched, poor, blind, and naked. That's complacency. And we want to talk about that for just a few moments. We need to be careful that we don't become complacent. We cannot become complacent in our knowledge of God's Word. Well, I know a little bit. I know enough to, uh, that I was baptized into Christ, and, and I know enough that I'm here on a Sunday morning. I know that I need to assemble with saints and, and, and so forth. And that's a good start. But we cannot become complacent. Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 3, First part of verse 18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We need to grow. We have to increase. The only way that that happens is through study. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, study to show yourselves approved. Actually, it says study to show thyself approved in the old King James Version. It says do your best in the English Standard Version. It says be diligent in the New King James Version version to show ourselves approved servants that don't need to be ashamed rightly dividing rightly handling the word of truth 
We have to study in order to be able to do that. We are to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord. That is a commandment. Well, why is that so? Why do we need to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord? If you look right there at, uh, at the, the context in 2 Peter, it's because there are those who are untaught and unstable who will take the scriptures and twist or pervert them to their own destruction and that we can be led away with the error of the wicked. So there's one reason. Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, Paul says this, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and all discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. As we learn God's word, we learn to approve those things that are excellent. The other side of that is to disapprove those things that aren't. The Hebrew writer in Hebrews chapter 5 says our senses are exercised to learn, to discern between good and evil. And he's talking about the, the fact that they haven't progressed in their knowledge. They need someone to teach them again the first principles of the oracles of God. We can tell the difference between right and wrong as we learn God's word. God is the one who determines what is right or wrong. You can't tell that from the way that our society operates these days. And, and even more so as, as time goes by and, and, and we drift further and further away from, from our underpinnings of the, of, the, of the founding of this, this country. But God gets to make those choices. God determines what is right or wrong. How we feel about something doesn't make it right. It can make it wrong. <laughs> but it can't make it right. I'm talking about Romans chapter 14. If we violate our conscience, it's sin, is what Paul says there. And I'm paraphrasing. But we learn God's word and we can tell the difference between right and wrong. We can do those things that God approves of and we can stay away from those things that God doesn't approve of. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, Peter says, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. In order to give a reason for the hope that's in us with meekness and fear, we need to know God's word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Our faith comes from hearing the word of God. The faith is the word of God. And we need to know it if we're going to give people a reason. We need to be able to talk with them. We don't study. We can't do that. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Paul says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We're to be transformed by the word of God. If we don't fill our hearts with God's word, how are we going to be transformed by it? 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verses 1 through 3 as Paul answers his critics there. He says, do we begin again to commend ourselves or do we need as some others epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. That transformation. If you want to have a conversation with somebody about Jesus, about the... the the fact that, that we're here to fear God and keep His commandments, if you want to have that conversation with somebody, then live your life that way. Fill your mind with the Word of God and live your life according to those precepts and you become an epistle. We sing that song. Sometimes the only Bible people are going to see is us. Make people ask that reason for the hope that's in you. Let them see that hope. Don't become complacent in your knowledge of the Word of God. One last example. What did we do in class this morning when I asked Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12, which was one of our memory verses on Wednesday nights a few months ago, just a few short months ago, and nobody could remember it. I had to go back and look it up. <clears throat> Something to ponder. Don't become complacent. We cannot become complacent in our righteousness. This was referenced also in class this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We read this passage in, in, in its entirety uh, within the last couple of weeks. may not read it all here, but turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 24. 
We cannot become complacent in our righteousness. We must be ever vigilant. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it, and everyone who competes for the prize is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. And then Paul goes on to list some examples of the Israelites who had been unfaithful and disobedient to God and the things that had happened to them because of that. He says in verse 11, Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. We become complacent. We will fall. In Philippians chapter 3, notice what Paul says there in Philippians the third chapter. Beginning in verse 12, he says, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. The apostle Paul, writing from prison, telling people to rejoice always, and again I say rejoice, and has already expressed the, the fact that it is better to depart and be with Christ, and he's hard-pressed between staying here and going and be with Christ, because it's far better. And yet he says, not that I have already attained, or am already perfected. I press on. How much more should we press on? We cannot become complacent. He says, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. Press. Work. Continue to strive, as we talked about in class. The battle never stops while we're here. The devil doesn't rest. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Temptation is all around us. And it just takes a moment. It just takes a moment to succumb. 2 Peter chapter 3. Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3. Peter is talking about the surety of the promise of God that Jesus is going to come back. He says in verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? What manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? Knowing that, that Jesus is coming back that we are here because of God's forbearance. Because God is long-suffering and doesn't want anybody to perish but for everybody to come to repentance. Verse 9. What manner of persons ought you to be? God in this holy conduct. We need to make sure that our lives fit in with what the gospel teaches us. That we're the kind of people that God demands of us. Be holy for I am holy. Do not become complacent. Now, that doesn't mean that we're doomed to fail because we're surrounded by temptation. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, Paul says that no temptation has overtaken us except that which is common to man. But God is faithful and provides us the way of escape, but we have to take advantage of it. And if we're complacent, we'll be less likely to do that. We cannot become complacent as a congregation. We cannot be complacent as a congregation. We each have work to do, and we need to do our share. Turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, if we're going to be built up, if we're going to be prepared to do the work of ministry, we each need to do our share. Ephesians 4 chapter. Verse 11. Paul says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers, and of course we don't have apostles and prophets anymore, and if you'd like to know more about that, get with me afterward, we can talk about it. Those things, we don't have any witnesses. 
to the resurrection of Jesus here today. We don't have any firsthand witnesses, and we also don't have any prophets because those things have ceased, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8. He gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effect of working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. We all have to do our part. And we don't all have the same function if you look at Romans 12 chapter. Romans chapter 12, there's no shame in the fact that we don't all hold the same function. It's complimentary. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 3. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt in each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Having then gifts differing according to grace that is given to us, let us use them. In prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. He who gives with liberality. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. We must each do our share. We cannot be complacent. And expect somebody else to do our part. And we must be on guard. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Beware of false prophets. And then uh, when Paul spoke to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20 chapter, he told them, turn with it, Acts 20 chapter. And he's speaking to elders here, but this is something that is not limited only two elders, Acts chapter 20, verse 28, Therefore take heed to yourselves, to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. That's for elders. Shepherding the church of God which you purchased with his blood. That's for elders. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. False teachers, false prophets are like ravenous wolves. They cost people their souls. And that's why Jude, in Jude verses 3 and 4, he said, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly men who turned the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. We have to be on guard. We have to be prepared to defend the faith. We have to be watching out for false teachers. We cannot be complacent as a congregation, and we cannot be complacent with the size of the church. Now, there is no inherent virtue in a large congregation. Let me say that again. There's no inherent virtue in a large congregation. The church's work can be done just as well in a small congregation as it can in a large congregation. But the thing is, is that the church doesn't need to be small because we're not doing our part to spread the gospel. Matthew chapter 13, and beginning in verse 18. Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 18. Jesus in explaining the parable of the sower, he says, Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, and the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart, this is he who received the seed by the wayside. And he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. When tribulation and persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. But he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it and indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some 
30. Behold, a sower went out to sow. It's our responsibility to be sowing the word of God, spreading the gospel to the lost and dying world around us. And if our church is small, if our congregation is small, because we're not doing that, well then shame on us. We'll be held accountable. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Beginning in verse 14. Now thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumph in Christ, and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death leading to death, and to the other the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? We're the aroma of life and the aroma of death. But we preach in the same message. It's the hearers. It's the hearers. They're the ones who determine whether that is the aroma of life or the aroma of death, how they receive the word. But we're to be diffusing that fragrance. That's what we're supposed to do. And you can see it as you, as you do that. You can see the way people react. There are some folks who will gladly listen. And there are some folks who are going to mock you and scoff and ridicule you. And that's just the way it is. But we can't become discouraged. Just because we live in a time when, as was mentioned in the prayer earlier, the the, the concern about spiritual things is it's ebbing. It's receding in this country. There are so many who have absolutely no concern about their soul. No understanding, no concern. And, and that's, that's the obstacle we face. But it's just like Jesus said, you know, there were four types of soil. And three of them were bad. But that didn't stop the sower from sowing because some of that seed is going to fall on the good ground. It's going to produce that crop. And we can't become discouraged. We have to continue to preach the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Beginning in verse 21, Paul said, For since the wisdom of God, in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are being called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message to preach to say, folks, we've got to get the message out there. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul gives some admonition to a young gospel preacher that we need to learn from as well. He tells Timothy, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering and teaching. For the time will come and they will not endure sound doctrine but according to their own desires because they have itching ears they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. We need to be ready to share the word at all times. We don't have to wait for the perfect opportunity to present itself to us in season and out of season. It's true for preachers, it's true for us as individuals. We cannot be complacent. We must be zealous and we must work vigilantly and diligently for our God. And that's our lesson for this morning. If you're here today and you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, I encourage you to do that while you have the opportunity.
Believe that Jesus is the Christ. Repent of your sins. Confess Him before men. Be baptized in water to have your sins washed away by the blood of Jesus. If you haven't done it, do it this morning. You will be added to the church by the Lord. You will have the hope of heaven. And if you're here and you're a child of God and your life hasn't been in keeping with His will, you need to repent. Because we're to be faithful until death. We expect to receive the trial of life. If you haven't been faithful, you need to repent. We pray with you for you. Whatever your need might be, won't you come forward and make it?